No. Well, let me take a moment to uh, welcome each and every one of our campuses. We are so excited that you're with us today as we continue in a series that we've been in over the past uh, two weeks together entitled How to Neighbor. Now, I'm going to make an honest confession. Uh, I don't know how many of you have ever thought about maybe doing something, and then you get closer and closer to the time that you're going to do it, and you begin to doubt yourself and think, what in the world have I gotten myself into? Today's topic is probably going to be one of the most controversial topics that I've ever spoken on here at North Star. And I want to start by just simply saying this. The vision here at North Star has always been very simple. We believe that God has called us to help the whole world find and follow Jesus. And we have always said that North Star is a place where everyone's welcome, and that means everyone. Uh, we, believe, we believe that everyone's welcome. Nobody's perfect, and that's every single one of us. None of us are perfect, and we believe that all things are possible with God. And in this series, what we've been doing is we've been looking at some of the major issues that we are facing around the world. And I believe that the church has the answer to all of these issues and so we started out the very first week talking about the issue of loneliness, how loneliness is something that is experienced in every nation, on every continent, by every single individual in the world. And we know that there is an answer and we have the answer to loneliness. And then last week we talked about poverty and how poverty is something that so many people deal with. And we talked about how we know the answer to poverty and what we need to do. Today I'm going to talk about racial reconciliation, and I know that this topic is a topic that makes a lot of people nervous. In fact, I'm very nervous, and I want to make an honest confession. I have, a very, I, have, I, am, I have very limited experience when it comes to racism, and I know that for me to stand here today and to say that I have the answer would be absolutely crazy, because I don't have the answer, but I believe that God's Word does, and I believe the church should be on the forefront of this issue. That we as God's people are called very specifically by God to be on the, on the forefront of the issue that is before us. And it's not just an issue that we are facing in the United States of America. It is a worldwide issue that is faced upon every single continent in the world. And I do not believe that one message today could change the entire world. But I believe that this message today could change the hearts of just a few people. In fact, if you go back to the book of Acts, you remember that there were 125 people in an upper room that were there with Jesus when the Holy Spirit came. And the Bible tells us that those 125 people turned the world upside down for Jesus. I believe in the same way today that God is going to take this message and maybe he's going to change some hearts in our church. And by changing an individual heart, maybe that will change a family, and that family will change a neighborhood, and that neighborhood could change a community, and that community could change a state, and the state could change the nation, and then the nation could change the world. Because I really believe that God has the answer and the solution to the racial problems and the issues that we are facing in our world today. So what I want to do is I want to begin with prayer and ask God through the power of the Holy Spirit, not only to speak through me today, but to open each and every one of our hearts to this message and what he has to say to each and every one of us. Would you pray with me, please? Father, I know that through the power of the Holy Spirit, you have something that you want to say to each and every one of us today. And I pray, God, that you would open our hearts to be able to hear your message. Lord, I know that we live in a world where racism and prejudice is experienced by people each and every day. And God, I know that this was never the plan that you had for this world, that God, you wanted us as believers, and especially those of us who call ourselves followers of Jesus, disciples of Jesus, Christians, you have called us to be on the forefront of this issue. And God, you have taught us and you have told us the answer and the solution to racial reconciliation. So today, I pray through the power of your Holy Spirit that you would open our hearts and our minds and God, that you would teach us, that you would change the hearts of some of the individuals inside of our congregation, and Lord, on each and every one of our campuses, and that we, as your children, would get up, we would walk out today, and we begin to live our lives differently because of what you're going to say. 
And so, Holy Spirit, we invite you, we ask you to speak now, for we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said together, amen and amen. I want to just begin today by just simply saying this. You know, I want you to imagine some things with me. I'm going to walk through a series of kind of statements that I think are going to help you to sort of think about what I'm going to talk about. First, I want you to imagine what it would be like to never get a job interview because of the color of your skin. Think about how hard, it, um, how hard you have worked to get where you are in the workplace. Maybe you put in two, three, four times the effort that everyone else had to put in, not because you weren't capable or because you were slower, but just simply because of the way that you look. Think about and imagine with me what it's like to be left out of a conversation or overlooked for a party based completely upon your physical appearance. Imagine walking into a room full of people and wondering if any of them secretly hate you, even though you don't know any of them and you've never met them before. Imagine what it would be like to be shopping in your favorite department store. And as you're shopping, you look over your shoulder and you notice that you're being followed by security personnel, even though you are a law-abiding citizen, never done anything wrong, and it's only based upon the color of your skin or maybe the clothes that you have chosen to wear on that particular day. Imagine being completely overlooked, not because you weren't capable, but because you were prejudged as not capable by those who were in charge. Imagine being stared at as you pick up your child from school because the color of your skin and the the way your hair looks is different than that of your child's. Imagine being called derogatory names by people because of how you look or the financial situation that you have found yourself in. You see, racism is real in our world today. In fact, I don't even have to say a whole lot about what's been going on in the news, but many of you know that our world is full of racism and prejudice. And God never intended for the world to be this way. God never intended for us to look at the outward appearance of a man or a woman and to judge them or make a judgment about who they are. In fact, it was Martin Luther King that said we should not judge people based upon the color of their skin, but the content of their character. And isn't it true that if all of us were really honest just for a moment, myself included, in some ways we have prejudged other people. We have been prejudiced inside of our hearts and our minds, and even in our own lives, maybe sometimes we have been a part of being a racist. I believe that God's word has the answer to this problem. And I believe that God speaks very specifically through Jesus in a time where the world found itself torn apart and there was racism that was prevalent in the day that Jesus lived. Today we're going to look at a story in the New Testament. And I want to encourage you to take out your message notes and to follow along with me as we look at this story together because Jesus confronts this issue. He talks very specifically about it, and I want you to listen to what happened. It's found right here in Luke chapter 10, verses 29 through 36. It says, the man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Because here's what he had done. He'd gone to Jesus, and he said, Jesus, he said, how do you, how do you, how do you get eternal life? And Jesus said, what do you think? And he said, well, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and you love your neighbor as yourself. And then he asked Jesus this question. He says, and who is my neighbor? And, and, and think about it. Here, here's what he meant. He says, you know, who is my neighbor? Like, Jesus, could you tell me, do I have to love that individual that is different from me? Maybe their skin color is different than me. Maybe they have earrings and tattoos on their body. Maybe they, they wear clothes that are different than my clothes. Maybe they come from a, a different socioeconomic background. Do I have to love that person, and is that person my neighbor? And so listen to what happens. Jesus replied with a story. He says, a Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. So it's a Jewish man who's traveling. He's attacked by bandits, and then notice what happens. It says they stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. So get the picture. Here this guy is. He's traveling, and and some bandits come, and they beat him up. And now he's probably in the ditch, kind of off the side of the road, laying there, dying. And the Bible goes on and it says this, it says, by chance a priest came along, but when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. So, so get the picture, he's, he's walking along, he, he sees the man lying there, and immediately he crosses to the other side of the road because he, he doesn't want to, to be contaminated, because particularly the, 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 the priest of the day, they believed, that, but according to the Jewish law, that if they touched anyone who was dead, they became defiled 
and it meant that he wouldn't be able to go to the temple. So he just ignores the man, right? There's a spiritual reason. He's just going to go on his own merry way. And then the Bible goes on and it says a temple assistant. So like an associate pastor, right? An associate pastor walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed on the other side. So he walks over, he sees him there, but he does the same thing. He just says, you know what? I'm going to pass him on the other side. And then Jesus shocks his audience. He says, then a despised Samaritan. Now, it's hard for us to understand this particular culture and what was happening when Jesus said this. Because when Jesus used these words, a despised Samaritan, the jaw of this man and the audience probably dropped to the floor. Because you see, Samaritans and Jews hated one another. In fact, if you don't know the history, what happened was some of the Jews were left when the exile happened, and, and, and they were left behind, and, and the, the reason they were left behind is because they had intermarried. There was interracial marriages that had taken place. And so the Jews and the Samaritans for over 700 years hated each other. In fact, in the New Testament, when you read, it, it tells you oftentimes the Jews would walk all the way around Samaria, so they never had to come in contact with the Samaritan people. That's how much they hated each other. And so here there is this despised Samaritan who has come along. And when he saw the man, I want us to say this out loud together. He what? He felt what for him? Compassion. He had compassion for him. Notice what the Bible goes on to say. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them up. It says, then he put the man on his own donkey and he took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I am here. Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to this man? So, so, so Jesus, not saying, hey, I want to tell you who the neighbor is. He's, he's talking about how to neighbor. He says, who was this man's neighbor? Who, who was the one that, that was the neighbor to this man? And listen to what he says. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do what? Do the same. Jesus encourages the man. He says, I want you to go and I want you to do the same. I want you to do exactly what this Samaritan man has done. Now you can imagine Martin Luther King said this. Martin Luther King Jr. said these words concerning this passage of Scripture. He said, the first priest and the Levite asked this. They said, if I stop this man, if I stop and help this man, what will happen to me? But the Samaritan turned it around and he reversed the question. He said, if I do not stop and help this man, what will happen to him? You see, the heart of the gospel The heart of what Jesus was conveying to this crowd on this particular day is that we are to love every human being who has ever been created in the image of God, especially those who are different than we are. You see, racism is not uh, uh, something that, that, that is a racial gene, right? There's not a racial gene that makes people racist. There's not a racial gene that makes people prejudiced. Racism is learned. And I believe there are three reasons that it's learned. Sometimes it's because it was experienced and out of experience because a person has been hurt. They begin to hate other people or they begin to to be prejudiced towards other people. For some, it's a place where they were raised. They were raised in such a way that they were taught not to like a certain group of people or they had a certain prejudgment or opinion about a certain group of people. And for others, maybe it's just simply ignorance, right? It's just simply ignorance. They They don't know any better. And the reality is that God wants us to understand something. And it's the bottom line today. It's the one thought that I want us to think about for the next few moments. You see, racism is not a skin issue. Racism is a sin issue. Now, that's not a popular statement. In fact, I didn't hear any amens this morning, right? Because people are like, whoa, hold on a second. But let me just tell you something. Racism is not a skin issue, guys. It's a sin issue. And you see, when we begin to see it for what it really is, it begins to change us on the inside because we begin to understand what Jesus really was saying. In fact, I want you to listen to what the Bible tells us in James 2.9. James was dealing with this whole idea of prejudice, prejudging, the idea that they were treating people differently. And in this particular church, it was that they were letting the rich people come and sit up front, and they were making those who were poor sit in other places. 
But then James broadens it. He says, but if you favor some people over others, you are committing what? He says, a sin. He said, anytime you show favoritism, anytime you're a racist, anytime you find yourself at the place that you are prejudging somebody else, that is sin. You are guilty of breaking the law. You are guilty of breaking the law. So you see, racism is not a skin issue, it's a sin issue. But the question that I want us to ask today is that if it is a sin issue, how do we neighbor those who are different than we are? How do we neighbor the people that, that maybe we've grown up going, hey, they're different than me. They're not exactly like me. They're not exactly, you know, I, I was taught not to care, necessarily care for those people. How do we, as God's people, neighbor those who are different from us? And I'm going to tell just one thing today I want to talk about. There's one point that I want to make and I want us to think about, and I'm going to give you a couple of sub points. I'm going to tell you a story and we're going to close. And it's just simply this. How do we neighbor those who are different? Well, if you and I are going to neighbor those that are different, we have to intentionally seek to love those different from from you. You have to intentionally seek. You have to say, God has commanded that not only do I love him, but I am to love other people. And guys, if you don't hear anything else I say today, I want you to hear this. Love is the answer and the solution to the most of the problems that we are facing in our world today. If we could just learn to love one another. Love is words in action. Love is when I say 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says, love is patient and love is kind. Love does not demand its own way. Love, love does what? Love shows mercy and grace. And, and love gives other people the benefit of the doubt is what the Bible tells us. And Jesus said this about those of us who are followers of Christ. Jesus said that if you're a follower of Jesus, they will know us by our what? Our love. That's right. They will know us by our love for one another. That's how the world will know we're Christians. When we love one another, no matter the color of our skin, no matter the background we come from. In fact, there in your notes, I want you to write this down because I think it's important. Racism isn't just the presence of hatred. It is the absence of love. It's the lack of loving other people. It's the lack of caring for those that God has placed around us. It's the act of not loving our neighbor as we love ourselves and caring for the people that God has placed around us. So how do we love people that are different than us? There are two things I think we must do. The first one is just simply this, by recognizing our own prejudice, by recognizing our own prejudice. Let's just be honest for a second. We all are prejudiced in some way. In fact, let me just define prejudice for you. Prejudice is prejudging. It's preconceived opinions that is not based on reason or actual experience. It's looking at someone and going, based upon what I see with my eyes, this is what I think about them. I'm prejudging them based upon the way that they, they look. It's a predetermined thought, a predetermined idea. In fact, I heard a story. Angela and I, in this series, we've been talking to a whole bunch of different people. Very specifically, next week when I'm going to talk about a bunch of families in our church that foster. And I heard a a story about a dad who had his daughter in the store with him. And his daughter had a different skin color than everybody else that was in the store. And, And he was telling us, he said, you know what? He said, my daughter overheard a woman in the store look at her daughter and say, say to her daughter, stay close to me, there are strange people in the store. He prejudged this young lady. He made a statement about this young woman. The mother did. She made a statement about this young woman. And let me tell you something. That is prejudice. That is racism. And that is not the way that God wants us to act. He does not want us to judge people based upon the color of their skin. I mean, think about it just for a second. We make prejudgments all the time. Some of you grew grew up and maybe in your home, you, you know, your parents taught you rich people are snobs. Heavy people are lazy. Young, the younger generation doesn't want to work. Mega church pastors are greedy. Uh, old people can't teach. White guys can't jump, right? And, and there are all of these different statements that are made. And we prejudge one another. And we'll say things like, I'm not a racist, right? I'm not a racist. But, and, and any time you put but after that statement, let me just tell you something. You're in trouble. I'm not a racist. I've got a Hispanic uh, friend. I'm not a racist. I've got black friends. I'm not a racist. I've got white friends. And you know something that God's been working on inside of me? God says, Marty, you don't have to describe other people by their skin. 
they're a human being. And in my life, I begin to say, hey, if I love other people, because sometimes, let me just tell you this, I'll be telling a story, and I have to say, hey, I was talking to this person the other day, and, and I'm not careful, if I'm not careful, I'll begin to describe who they are. You know, it was a Hispanic guy, or a Hispanic woman, or it was an African-American man, or it was a white guy. I mean, why do I say that? It's because, I, in some ways, if I was really honest, it's subtle racism. Let me just tell you who this person was so that you can prejudge what I, what, what I was experiencing or what was going on. And so you know what? I just began to say to God, God, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I, I, I want to be the kind of person that I just say, I was talking to a man the other day. I was talking to a woman the other day. I was talking to a young boy or a young girl. It doesn't matter the color of their skin. It doesn't matter their ethnicity because, listen, we all are human beings in the eyes of God. And you know what? I'm learning I'm thankful that God loves variety. I'm thankful that God created us different. I'm thankful that God placed us in different places around the world. And God says that as his people, we are to love one another. How do we do that? We do that by, we, we, we love those that are different than us by recognizing any prejudice that we have. And then secondly, notice this. We have to seek to understand. We have to seek to understand others. And let me just say this, all right, because I know that I am speaking to a predominantly white congregation. Guys, we need to learn to understand other people. You see, oftentimes we don't understand what other people have experienced in their life and what they have gone through. And it's important for us. It's important for us to look around and observe the world around us and to see how people are treated differently, to make friends with people that are different from us. And then when you do, what you begin to do is you begin to see the other side of the issue. You begin to see how other people have been treated and what they are gone through. In fact, my son Andrew, when he was growing up, he played sports. He actually acted in a local theater, and, and he was active in the student ministry here at North Star. He was telling me one night, he said, Daddy, I had never seen mistreatment of other people. He said, until I started working at Lowe's. And he said, in the lumber yard, I was amazed at the number of people that would drive in and make racial comments about other people that worked in the lumber yard. And it so bothered Andrew that anytime anybody said something, Andrew would look at them and call them out and say, hey, I want you to know that that person is my friend and what you just said is wrong. Now, I was proud of him. I was like, son, I am so proud of you. I'm like, I'm surprised somebody ain't punched you in the face, but I'm proud of you. And he's like, daddy, I'm just going to tell you right now, I'm not going to stand up for it. I am not going to stand there and let somebody verbally use words that create an injustice towards others. And man, I thought to myself, what a great Christian. Because isn't that the way that all of us should be as followers of Jesus you see, if it doesn't bother you that people in front of you are treated differently, if it doesn't bother you by the jokes that are told and the things that are said, then friend, listen to me, something is wrong on the inside. As a disciple of Jesus, it should bother us. It should bother us. And we should say, you know what? I I'm not going to listen to that. I'm not going to let somebody say that. I'm not going to participate in that because you know what? That is prejudice. That is racist and it's wrong. And Jesus has called us to love one another. I heard a story this week that was life-changing for me. In 1996, a group of KKK members held a rally in Michigan. In this particular rally, they knew that there was going to be problems, and so the police separated the KK mem KKK members from the protest. Uh, one KKK member was in infiltrated on the other side. He, he went to the other side, and while he was over there, somebody yelled out, kill the Nazi, and the crowd started beating the man. There was an 18-year-old um, African-American girl named Keisha Thomas who threw her body on top of this man. Here she is. And she said, I'm not going to let this happen. Even though this man, if you look at the picture, had on a jacket and, 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 and tattoos on his arms that said that he probably would do something to harm her. She said, ain't no way I'm going to allow this to happen. 
She was asked later why she did it. Why would somebody like her risk her life in the middle of this crowd and throw herself on top of this man to keep these people from beating him to death? And here's what she said. She said, I knew what it was like to be hurt. The many times that it had happened, I wish someone would have stood up for me. She was like the Samaritan. She said, you know what? I'm going to stand up for him. She crossed the street. She protected somebody that was different than her. And Thomas said this. She says, I have tried throughout my life since then. To say that I'm going to live in such a way that I'm not going to stereotype other people. That I'm not going to look at them any differently than myself. That they are a human being. And she said these words. She said, the biggest thing that you can do to fight racism and prejudice in our world today is just to be kind to another human being. To just simply look them in the face and to look them in the eye, to, con- to make eye contact with them, to smile at them. It doesn't have to be some huge monumental thing that you do. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, I want you to listen to what the Bible says. It says this, Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on him. He is the Lord of us all and he richly blesses all who call on him. What does he say? Jew and Gentile. We're all the same. None of us are different in God's eyes. Every single one of us was created in his image. And he tells us, hey, every single one of us are what? Every single one of us are the same. You see, God loves Asian Americans. God loves African Americans and Latin Americans and Native Americans. And God even loves cat-loving Americans, all right? God loves people. And guys, listen to me. God loves Cubans and Hondurans and Nigerians and Jamaicans and Koreans and Malaysians and Canadians and Pakistanians and Iranians and Croatians and Russians. God has created every single one of us. And we were created in his image and being created in his image, he has called us to love one another. And heaven is going to be wonderful and amazing and it's going to be diverse, guys. In fact, listen to what the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. It simply says this. It tells us in verses 9 and 10, it says that after this I saw a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation and tribe and people and language, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes, and they held palm branches in their hands, and they were shouting with one great war, salvation, salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. Heaven is going to be made up of every tribe, in every nation, in every race. And you see, what God wants us to understand is that we are called right here on earth to love one another, to love one another. On June the 22nd of this year, 2016, it marked the 20th anniversary of Keisha Thomas throwing herself, her body, on top of the man who was getting beat. I read an article this weekend that said this. It said, Thomas, who now resides in Houston, learned that Albert Kiel, McKeel, his junior, had died a couple of months ago when Kiel's son called her. Putting his 12-year-old daughter on the phone, or his 12-year-old sister on the line, to tell her that she might not be alive today if it hadn't have been for this young woman's actions. Here's what Thomas said, and I thought it was very, very, it was very, very revealing. She said, when I heard that, I thought this was the future and the past of what peace has created Thomas said. The real accomplishment of all of this to me is to know that his son and his daughter don't share the same views that he had. History didn't repeat itself, and that's what gives me hope, is that the world can get better from generation to generation. Guys, I believe with all of my heart that as followers of Jesus, we have been called to the front lines. We are called by Christ to understand That racism and prejudice is not a skin issue. It is a sin issue. And as followers of Jesus, he tells us how to neighbor. We are called to love people that are different than ourselves. My prayer today is that our church and that us as individuals would be the kind of church that loves people who are different than us. I think it's one of the greatest hallmarks of who we are. We are a church of diversity. We are a church that says everyone's welcome, nobody's perfect, and anything is possible with God. And may we continue to be the hands and the feet of Jesus to those in this world 
that are different than us. Let's pray together. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed and no one looking around, I know this morning that God has been speaking to some of us, and I really believe that many of us in our hearts want to be part of the solution to the problem that we're facing in our world today. And I want to give you an opportunity if you're here today at one of our campuses and you say, you know, Pastor Marty, I really do want to be a part of the solution. I want to love people that are different than me. I want to admit that there are prejudices in my life. And God, I, I really want to seek to understand those that maybe have had a different experience than I've had. And I want to be a part of the solution to the problem. If that's you, I want to pray for you today. And with heads bowed, eyes closed, and no one looking around, if you say, God, I want to be a part of the solution to this racial problem in our, in our world today, would you just raise your hand? I'm going to pray for you. Thank you. Man, God bless you. Thank you guys so much. God bless you. And you can put your hands down, and I'm going to pray for you right now. Father, I thank you for all the hands that have been raised today that's saying, hey, I want to be a part of the solution to the problem. And Lord, I pray that you would help us as a church to, to come to the forefront of this issue and to say that we want to be like the Samaritan. We want to cross the street to our neighbor. We want to walk down the road to those that are different than us and say we love them and we care about them and we want to show your love and your care for them. And God, we know that people are different than we are. And maybe for some of us, we were raised in such a way that God, in our hearts and in our lives, we were taught to be prejudiced or we were, caught, we were taught racism, but we know that in our heart, it is sin and it is wrong and we don't want to live that way any longer. And so, Lord, I pray that you would free us from that and I pray that you would help us to live our lives differently as we leave this place today with our heads bowed and our eyes closed and no one looking around. For others of you, I believe maybe you walked in today and you never realized how much God loved you. And maybe it's because other people have treated you differently. Or maybe it's because what you've experienced in your life. And for some of you, maybe you've never been able to overcome this issue in your life. But today, I want you to hear what God says. God says that if any of us will call upon the name of the Lord, we can be saved. And today, if you have never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I want to give you an opportunity right now to do that. You say, Pastor Marty, what do I have to do? First, you just got to admit that you're a sinner. We talked about it just a few moments ago. Every single one of us have sinned in God's eyes. And God loved you so much that he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for your sins, to be buried and then resurrected. And today, if you'll open your heart and your life to him, he will come in and he'll save you. You say, how do I do that? Very simple. You can pray a prayer, something like this in your heart. Dear God, I confess to you that I am a sinner. And I ask you to forgive me of my sin. Please come into my heart and be the Lord and the Savior of my life. Thank you, God, for loving me. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. Help me to live the Christian life now in the best way that I can. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, if you just prayed that prayer, the greatest decision of your life. In fact, I want to pray for you right now, and I'm going to ask you to do something that's very brave across all of our campuses. If you just prayed that prayer so that I can pray for you, would you just raise your hand right now? Just hold it up there and say, Pastor Marty, I prayed that prayer. Thank you, and God bless you. Somebody else, thank you so much across all of our campuses. Thank you, and God bless you, and you can put your hands down now, and I want to pray for you. Father, for those today who are stepping across the line of faith for the first time, I thank you, and Lord, we celebrate those decisions across all of our campuses. Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would help us as a church not only to celebrate their newfound relationship in Christ, but God, you would help us today to help them grow in their relationship with you. Father, as we get up and leave our individual campuses today, I pray that you would help us to realize that racism is not a skin issue, but it's a sin issue. And help us to love those that are different than us and to live that out this week with every single human being, God, that you lead us towards. For we pray and we ask this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people together said, amen and amen. Hey, at all of our campuses today, if you committed your life to Christ, I just want you to know that we as a church celebrate that. And I'm going to ask us if we put our hands together and celebrate all those who are committing their life to Christ today. Man, we're so, so excited.
In just a few moments, we're going to receive the offering. Before we do, I want to encourage you to do something. If you committed your life to Christ today, if you'll turn over on the back of the connection card right up there at the top, you can check off today, I'm committing my life to Christ. And we're going to send you a packet of information. Nobody's going to come by your house, show up on your front doorstep, anything like that. But this week, we're going to send you a packet of information that will help you know how you can grow in your relationship with Christ. And so right now, we're going to receive an offering. If you're a first-time visitor with us today, we want you to know, hey, listen, we don't want you to give anything. We're just excited that you're here. If you want to give, feel free to do that. But you can place your connection card in the offering bucket as it's passed by. Those of us who are attenders and regular members here at North Star, this is our opportunity to give back to God as he has blessed us. And so I'm going to ask at all of our campuses on your right or left, if you'll find the buckets, you can pass them towards the inside. Uh, for those of you that are online, if you want to give, you can just look right up there to the, uh, to the left and you'll see the give button and you can just uh, hit that button and that way uh, you'll be able to give, participate and to be a part. Again, we're very, very excited that you're here with us today. And if you're a first time guest, we want to give you a gift. It's a book called How Good is Good Enough. Um, and that is our way of saying thank you for being with us today. And so on your way out at all of our campuses, there's a table there. You can pick one of those books up and take it with you. And um, we want you to know we're just very, very excited that you have been with us today. Next week, we're going to be ending our series. And so I'm going to ask you, if you would, to turn your attention towards the screens and see a preview for next week's message. <laughs> If you know any kids, be sure and invite